let's bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. O oh Lord, may we have the understanding of scriptures through the work of the Holy Spirit. This morning, let your light shine in and through us. We pray in the blessed name of Jesus, our risen Lord and only Savior. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 12, found on page 688 of the Pew Bibles. Listen now for the word of God. <clears throat> Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of the Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteousness, righteous judgments, the delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, and you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. If such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself is to bow down the head like a bulrush, to lie in sackcloth and ashes. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer and you will cry for help and he will say, Here I am. If we remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson this morning is found on page four of the New Testament section of your Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. The uh, bulletin says that we're reading from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20, but actually I've caught those last four verses, so we're just reading Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. I invite you now to listen for the word of the Lord. You're the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill, built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. That's Susie. Oh, she's just such a ray of sunshine. Good old George, what a guy. He's just the salt of the earth. The light of the world, the salt of the earth. These are sayings that we hear often. We say them routinely. We say variations of them in our conversations with others or about others. 
We use them casually to praise somebody who's cheerful and energetic. Honey, you just light up the place when you walk into a room. You are just the light of the world. Or we use them to thank people for being especially nice or doing something sweet. You know, you light up my life. You are the light of my world. We use them when we mean to say that somebody's just good people, just plain folks, basic, honest, down-home kind of people, practical, nothing pretentious about them, reliable, the kind of folks you can count on. They're just who they are, the salt, the salt of the earth. It sounds like a good thing, doesn't it, to be called the salt of the earth or to be called the light of the world? There's no harm in salt or light. But perhaps we should take these things that we toss off, perhaps we should take them a little more seriously. We're in such a habit of saying them casually that when Jesus exhorts his disciples today to be the salty salt and to not hide their light under a bushel, to not hide it away, when he says that, we might wonder, well, who would even consider doing that anyway? Who would want to hide their light and why? Jesus reminds them that the fate of salt that has lost its saltiness is just to be tossed out the door, thrown on the floor. Jesus reminds them that hiding a light is foolish. It's silly. It's as silly as when I put the trash bag over that lamp there. Hiding a light is foolish. A light that is hidden is useless, and it's as useless as that unsalty salt. So who would want to be so bland or so useless? Again, who would hide their light? And why would they do it? But some do. Strangely, some people do. So maybe there's more at stake than initially meets the eye. Salt and light. Salt and light. Let's look at those things a little more closely. They're common, everyday, ordinary things, things that we are certainly familiar with, things that we use all the time. They're things that the people that Jesus spoke to would have been just as familiar with. They also use them every day in the same manner that we do. Salt and light. Common items. Common everyday items that common everyday people, simple people like us, and like the tradesmen and the fishermen and the others who followed Jesus could relate to. Salt and light. Basic, but indispensable. We can relate to them just as easily as those people of Jesus' time could, and we can relate to those basic salt-of-the-earth kind of people in Jesus' day, too, because we have a lot in common with them. So let's take a look at those two things first. What do we know about salt? What are its properties? Well, one, it cures or preserves. Think of salt cod fish that's dried out in a box in layers of salt, or more to my taste, think of country ham. I'm gonna be hungry by the end of this sermon. Salt heals. If you've ever had a sore throat, I suspect you've been advised to gargle in salt water. It really helps. And you might consider washing a wound in salt water. Now, it's going to sting like the dickens. i got to warn you on that. But as that sodium chloride forces the liquid in our cells out of our body, it forces any liquids that are bacterial, too. It will do a pretty effective job of cleaning out toxins. Three, salt provides essential nutrients, and salt gives savor, flavor. It brings out the best in whatever it's used on. Think of how bland a bowl of unsalted grits is. Or think how scrambled eggs come alive with flavor when you sprinkle just a little salt on them. And we've all tasted that pot of soup that we're making and we go, you know, it needs salt. And so we take a little salt and we throw it in the pot and bam, the flavor comes alive and all the goodness All the goodness gets sharpened. And light. What about light? Light guides, light illumines. Light makes things more beautiful. Light makes us feel safe. 
It shows us the way. It shows us the way, and it shows others the way. And it shows things as they really are. And this light, though, this light that Jesus talks about, I think it's something really special. Something more than something we may, might just casually toss around in glib phrases. This is the light of the world. The light of the world. But wait a minute, the light of the world, that's Jesus, isn't it? Wasn't it Jesus, am I remembering correctly? Wasn't it Jesus that just a few weeks ago in our scripture lesson when he went down to Capernaum and called those fishermen, he was calling his disciples? Wasn't it Jesus that the same scriptures tell us was the great light? That light that the people living in darkness and living in the shadows of death have seen. The great light that has dawned. And wasn't it Jesus that the gospel writer John says that he came to testify about that light that light that was breaking into the world, this new light, the light of all humankind, the light that shines in the darkness, the light that the darkness has not overcome. Isn't it Jesus that John was talking about when he says, the true light, the true light that gives light to everyone? And don't we recall Jesus himself saying somewhere in the scriptures that he was the light of the world? We didn't have that in our uh, absolution today, our assurance of pardon. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The answers to all those questions is yes, 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 and yes. In John's gospel account, Jesus says clearly in chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And then he goes on to say, whoever follows me will never dark walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So that's it. This is exactly where everything just turns in an extraordinary way. The whole order of the cosmos, the whole order of being just shifted right in this one moment. And if we're not careful, we might miss this really incredible event. You know, our lectionary doesn't really do us a good service last week and this week in breaking into two weeks the sermon that is in last week's gospel lesson, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and this week's lesson. It doesn't do us a lot of good in breaking those things in two because it's all part of one piece. Jesus is the light, and he's now giving the light to those who follow him. And those followers are those same motley fishermen and tradesmen and accountants and tax, tax office clerks that, a Jesus, that Jesus addresses right here today in this portion of his great sermon, his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And if you recall, in the scripture right before ours today, he's just giving a long list, a long list of blessed are they who phrases. Blessed are they who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, the meek, the pure in heart, those who are the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And then he ends this extraordinary list by turning directly to the disciples and telling them, blessed are you. See, he's just said, blessed are they, and now he says, blessed are you. Blessed are you when you are persecuted because of me. You're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. There's really no break between those two things. Blessed are you when you are persecuted because of me. You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. So suddenly now we see things. We see things in a whole new light. We see things in a whole, a whole lot differently. The fate of his disciples when they receive this light that Jesus has just passed to them is to be persecuted, is to be insulted, and it's to have all sorts of evil things said about them. Jesus tells them, you're going to be persecuted in the same way the prophets were who were before you. You're the light of the world. So now in the light of that understanding, we can see exactly who and why somebody might want to hide their light 
under that bushel. Jesus is the light of the world, and he doesn't divest himself that, but he passes that light on to them. And in doing so, he passes on to them all that goes with it. When I was a teenager, in youth groups at church, we used to love to sing this song, Pass It On. I don't know if you all know it. We took a candle, and we'd start at one end. It was in the darkened sanctuary. And we'd light the candle, and then we'd pass it down the row. And the lyrics of the song, were, uh, song was, uh, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. Well, that's just what Jesus has done here. He has shared his glorious light and started, started some kind of amazing fire, amazing fire that's going to light up the world. So why would anybody hide it? Hide it or drop it, we might say. We might because maybe it's just a little too much for us. Maybe it's a little too hot to handle. You see, this light carries with it great responsibilities, tremendous responsibilities, as we see in our reading from Isaiah today. Responsibilities for holding the world accountable, as Isaiah said in 58.1 that we just read. Connie just read that for us. Holding the world accountable and shouting out to it its sin and rebelliousness from God's ways. That's the kind of thing that could get a guy persecuted. Holding it accountable for its hypocrisy as it feigns righteousness. Going through the motions and saying how much it loves God, but all the while being self-serving. We live in a self-serving world. The world is self-serving. The world goes about oppressing others, oppressing workers, getting fat, while others go hungry. Constantly quarreling and fighting. We have certainly not seen a whole lot of that light lately. We have seen a lot of the other. We have certainly not seen a lot of light shining lately, have we? Our political discourse is at an all-time low. We're bickering, we're belittling each other, we're name-calling, snubbing, we're finger-pointing in the most childish ways. We could use some light. And maybe we could use some salt and maybe a little salt water to kind of wash out some people's mouths. Here's what the scriptures tell us to do. As followers of Jesus, we're to be salt and light. The very ones that those disciples were to care for, all those those who's on that list that Jesus gave, Those who are meek, those who are poor, the humble, and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. All those who mourn. Those are all the people we should be salt and light for. Preserving, healing, curing, bringing flavor, bringing flavor to their lives so that their lives aren't so bitter. Showing them, guiding them out of the darkness, out of the shadow of death. Showing them a new way, a better way. Showing them the way. Helping them see God's love made manifest in our actions. And in seeing that, to see a more beautiful world. But that isn't always easy. That carries risks, especially when we become, when we become that light that shines even in the darkest corners and even in the darkest cracks to show the way that things really are in the world. But blessed we will be and blessed we are and blessed we will be when people revile us or persecute us or hate us for showing what is, for showing what is and for the sake of righteousness, showing what is for the purpose of showing Jesus to them. Here's what the light shows is the way things really are today. The gap between the rich and the poor in our country is the widest it's ever been. According to Money Magazine, 1% of Americans 
control 36.5% of the country's total wealth. The richest 10% control 75% of the wealth of our country, and that leaves only 25%, 25% of our country's total wealth to the remaining 90% of Americans. Well, so what? So what, we might ask? So what? Well, here's so what. Because of that, 15% of people in the Charlotte metro area, and that includes Kannapolis, 15% of us, a staggering 385,381 people, live below the poverty line right now. There are approximately 21 homeless people in Mecklenburg right now, with 80,000 people just in Mecklenburg, and the number's going to increase if I include Cabarrus, 80,000 people are one paycheck away from homelessness right now. The average rent is $1,100 per month, which means that a worker earning minimum wage would have to work 109 hours a week to afford a two-bedroom apartment. That's a mother and, a, and her children. 109 hours at minimum wage. To afford a one-bedroom apartment, it would maybe be a little better. You don't only need to work 94 hours a week at minimum wage. Well, we must bring God's light into this, and we must say something is wrong right now if that situation is wrong. Do we build more affordable housing, or do we dismantle systems that keep people in poverty and keep them from being able to afford housing? Or do we do both? We must do something about all of this. In our Old Testament lesson today, we find what God would have us do right now. To share our bread with the hungry. This is straight from Scripture. To share our bread with the hungry. To bring the homeless poor into our house. To cover and clothe the naked. And God tells us through his prophet to humble ourselves and choose. Choose to loose the bonds of injustice to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to break everything that binds and everything, to break everything that blinds anyone, anywhere, from seeing the light of God's love and from seeing God's righteousness and basking in it, and basking in it as children of God. And to do all that, to do all that even if we are reviled and persecuted and hated for it by those who stand to gain from keeping the light of Christ out of the darkness. What happens when we don't shine the light is that we just get more of the same of what we've got and the world isn't going to be any brighter for it. Here's what happens if we do. If you remove the yoke from among you, if you stop pointing the finger, if you stop speaking evil, if you offer your food, to the hungry. And satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Sheltering the homeless. And clothing the naked. Then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like noonday. See how much brighter the world is? See how much brighter the world is when we do? Here's a story. Where did I put that? There it is. 
Here's a story I heard just this week. There was a man who was responsible for warning trains that the bridge down the tracks had washed away. One night, a train came and the man showed his lamp, but the train went right into the chasm. The man was taken to court and when he was forced to testify to the events, surrounding the train accident. He was forced to testify and he was asked, were you on duty that night? And he answered, yeah. Did you wave your lamp at the train? The man answered, yes. He was dismissed and he was held not responsible. After his testimony though, on his way home with a friend, he said, I'm glad the light that the uh, judge didn't ask me if my lamp was on. How will we answer? Is your lamp on? It makes a difference, doesn't it? That little light of yours, will you let it shine? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And unless you uh, read New Testament Greek, you're just going to have to take my word for it when I tell you that when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, he was speaking in the plural. He said, you, all of you, all of us, are the light of the world. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen.